and Arabic books, and a coffee bar that serves and sells the finest quality coffee beans and exquisite teas. This is Wafa Al-Abidat. You are listening to the Women Power Podcast, a subsidiary platform to the Women Power Summit, the largest event in MENA, with the aim of empowering women and helping them achieve their absolute highest potential. Each week on the Women Power Podcast, you will hear honest, vulnerable, authentic, real conversations from inspiring women. These women will share their experiences and stories into what it takes to build a successful business and career. The podcast will share insight and inspiration and hopefully inspire action and lead change. Sara Dabak is a successful event planner and entrepreneur with her own company Lace Events based in Saudi Arabia. Recent events organized by Sara include the Saudi Arts Council's annual art exhibition and the gala dinner for Vogue Italia Jeddah Vogue Fashion Experience. How has COVID impacted you and impacted your business? It's funny how you've mentioned that and and, um, not that there's anything wrong with the word event planning, but I just I've always also struggled in in, in trying to find the right word to describe what I do or how I feel. But it's always, you know, so I just sometimes I don't even label it because I just feel like it's there's no right word and it it keeps changing. But anyways, uh, about COVID, um, of course, like the rest of the world, it, it um, and it affected uh, it, it affected me a lot, and especially in the beginning because my kind of business was just completely it stopped. It's not something that you can kind of uh, you know maneuver around. It's all about human interaction and and events, which completely stopped. So for me, uh, the worst part was just you know uh, not being able to do what I love and trying to see how. Especially, you know, in the very beginning, you know, you don't know how long this is going to last. Well, in the very beginning, we thought it was going to last two weeks. And then eventually we realized that that's not happening. So by the time, you know, we started um, realizing that this is here to stay a while, you know, I was super sad because I realized that this is going to take a while. And um, I don't, you know, I just don't know how to uh, to not work or not to be doing uh, what I love. It was difficult. I tried to do things just for myself to stay active at home. Uh, I would do these, um, I called them fancy Fridays uh, for my parents and I, uh, and I would just, you know, just to stay creative and to, to try to inspire people because everyone all around the world was just super down. And so I thought it would just be fun. It started with me wanting to do something fun for my parents and for myself, uh, setting up a nice dinner table and dressing up and having dinner downstairs. So that was, you know, for the first uh, couple of months. And then when things started opening up a bit, it, it picked up faster than I thought it, it would in terms of events. To be honest, I didn't think that people would actually, um, you know, uh, I've had weddings that were you know uh were supposed to happen last march and everything they had to be postponed and they didn't know till when but i was happily surprised to see that a few of the brides wanted to just go ahead with it and go with and and just go with the guidelines of, of the government of having 50 people and you know they've been great because they turned out to be super intimate and just how I think they, sh- they should be. So, yeah. So, so first of all, like how many people is behind the Sara Adabar brand? Is it, are you a one man show or do you have a full fledged team? So in the beginning, of course, now it's been almost, almost 10 years, which, which is crazy. For, for a while, it was a one man show in the very beginning because I didn't know how to delegate. I didn't know, you know, it's something, it's, it felt like my baby and I didn't know how to have people do things, you know, except... Uh, you know, labor work and things like that and people that uh, were actually, you know, that I would hire to do stuff. But in terms of office work and, and behind the scenes and, and running errands and getting things done and designing, I, you know, there was no one that I felt can do my job for me. And it took me a couple of years to slowly to learn that. It's, it's a, I'm still learning. I'm, I'm still bad at it, at delegating and having people do things for me. But I've learned and I've come a long way. So I do uh, you know, it's it's having an assistant, it's having someone helping you run the errands. And then it's, of course, people that are on the ground and all of that. So what helped me during COVID is that uh, a lot of things in terms of events, I have people that are working for me either part time and um, and I just I deal with different suppliers instead instead of having everything in house. And that decision I've made a while back when I was trying to choose how I want my company to be. And I did that because 
I knew what kind of person I am. I knew myself very well and I knew that I needed to have my space to if I wanted to have some time off to uh, to kind of restore and recharge and get inspired and get on a plane when we could get on a plane and leave for a little while, I I had the the space to do that um, because you know uh, the bigger you are, the bigger your responsibility is, the less flexibility you have in terms of that. And I felt that that wasn't me, and I wanted to stay true to myself. So that's the path I kind of chose. So that's so interesting because what what I hear from you is you've chosen not to scale because what gives you joy is working more intimately with a much smaller team, but also what's important to you is flexibility and being able because having a bigger team is more structure, more processes, more operations. And then that also means you have to bring in enough business to retain your staff. So then you're an awama like more business to take care of my staff. And so you've chosen to make those decisions. Do you think that that's something that's going to change? Or do you feel like actually, no, this is perfect for me, assistant, maybe a project manager, and that's it. And everything else is outsourced. Everything is kind of connected in the way of the amount of projects you take and in, in how big they are and how close they are to each other. And, you know, everyone has a different perspective when it comes to that. And not everyone maybe would agree that this is the best way. But I truly believe that everyone is different and everyone has to do what they think works best for them. I have people who would tell me, no, you're not doing it right because you could you know, uh, go bigger and have more business and make more money this way. And so again, that goes back to priorities and to what works for you. Uh, Because uh, for me, this whole thing did not start as a business plan. It started as a passion and something that I've always wanted to do and and I've loved. And I've and I felt that if it uh, if I lost that, then I won't be doing it the way that I wanted to do it. Like I said, it's been 10 years, so almost 10 years. So Things have changed. I did go a bit bigger than I thought I would, maybe in the beginning. So I don't know what the future holds or if this changes a little bit, but it won't change that much because I would rather keep the passion and keep things the way that they are somewhat, but giving myself also room to grow and change because that's very important. Uh, but in terms of uh, expansion, I think instead of, and with COVID also, a lot of ideas came to mind and things that I've always wanted to do, but thought I'll do it later on in life now felt like, oh, maybe I should tap into that sooner. So expansion is not necessarily uh, growing bigger in in terms of capacity of events, but rather the different paths that I wanted to take under the umbrella of of LACE events. From what I understand, just but I've been following you for so long and just, you know, um, I've been following your work is, you know, it feels to me like you're very selective. So is it hard for you to say no, you know, to something or to like not, res- you know, not respond to like emails and DMs and like all this kind of noise and for you to focus? Um, and does it ever get overwhelming to walk away from things? So it's not easy to say no, but I think it's as important to know when to say no, as important it is as to t- say yes and to take on projects because, and for me saying no isn't because like, no, I don't want to take that project, but it's, it's, um, it's more like uh, timing wise, does that, w- will I be able to do this and give it a hundred percent given that I have that other project, which is very close in time? Uh, do I feel that this project fits Uh, what I do, you know, because like I told you, I've always struggled with kind of labeling what it is that I do. So I've gotten projects before that were more maybe like corporate or more based on uh, someone who wants more of logistics rather than uh, than visual and aesthetic and design. So I am it's it's sometimes hard for me to explain to them that this is not really uh, under my scope of work. And I would rather that you reach out to a company that is more uh, based on on marketing and 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 someone that will fit more of what you have in mind and it's not easy because you know sometimes they'd be like no but we want you to do it we love what you do but I just feel like yeah but it doesn't I don't see myself doing this event you know I don't feel that I'm the right person so it's more of just knowing what fits under your umbrella and your ideas and it's it's not easy but I've I've learned how to kind of categorize and explain why I feel that this project doesn't fit me so well and sometimes it's a great opportunity and it's a really big project but I just don't feel that this is for me 
how many projects do you take on in a year? Do you put like a number and you're like, this is it? Or do you do one at a time and then you don't sign up to the next one until one is over? So it's it's kind of different. It's uh, it's interesting that ever since I started working, I felt like things haven't changed from when I was studying because my my work year is very similar to my high school and, and college life year in terms of this, the year starts in September rather than January. People come after the summer, events start between September, October, then the weather gets really nice. So uh, everyone wants to do everything in the winter time, And then there's like a bit of a break in April, which I take off. And then a little bit more during Ramadan, uh, and then the summer comes off, and I use and I would take the summers off uh, for me to be able to recharge because after the summer it's kind of back to back. So it's more it's it's more that it's been structured in a way where uh, people do events in certain times of the year, and and they kind of stuck to that. So there's so I kind of choose them depending on size of events. So sometimes if I have a big wedding, let's say in January, and I know that that's going to take me, that, that I need time off before it, I can't take projects two weeks to three weeks prior and two weeks after because I know that I'll need to recover. So it, it's kind of based on the scope of work for that specific event that I decide that I can take a smaller one after and then like a bigger one after that. So I structure them that way um, so that I can, give 100% to all of them. Have you ever done a, like an initial meeting? You're like, okay, I'll take this meeting. This seems interesting. And then in the meeting, you're like, oh my God, very difficult. I can't deal or this is not a project I would do. And then how would you back out from that? It's rarely has it happened from an actual meeting. I usually kind of sense it on the phone. But of course it has happened for different reasons. Not, not because I feel like, you know, it's difficult or something, but just... I don't see it happening for whatever reason. And usually um, it's either, you know, there's always, you, you need to always have a backup plan. So, you, you know, you, you can say that you've, you have projects coming up, which is true, it's not a lie, but that you won't be able to take on that project uh, on top of all of that. You know, you just, you know, you have to be a very diplomatic, you have to be uh, a professional about it and you have to make sense to them. You know, they, um, they need to, to realize that, yes, we both agree that this is not going to work out for one reason or the other, you know. When you started out 10 years ago, Sara, you know, what you did with laces was really, I don't want to say it's revolutionary, but it was transformative because nobody had done these kind of events or these, no one has created experiences the way you did. Like it was a full 360 uh, holistic um, experience or so sound, food, design. It wasn't the usual plasticky um, cookie cutter kind of events um, or setup, you know. So, and then on top of that, you were visually curating your social media as well. So we were able to not just see these beautiful photos, but like you would put little pictures of your family or like a corner of your office. And it's like it was a it was a brand that it, yani extended the event. You know, it's like a lot. It's, it's it was a brand. It wasn't just this is an event. I'm done. There was like a whole energy behind it. But 10 years ago, when you started out, you were you know, you really stuck out. And I think what's happened in the last 10 years is people saw what you were doing and possibly you were one of the first people to pioneer this in this part of the world. And then all of a sudden, you know, 10 years later, there's hundreds, if not thousands of people mirroring each other and adopting the same look and feel, the ideas, the way the photos and the videos are taken, but also curating their accounts. Like it was your personality, it's Sara's personality in laces. But then somebody in Dubai is like looking at that account and then they're taking parts of that and and putting it on their account. But it's not it's not their personality. So I, and I don't want to say I don't want to use the word copycat because, you know, we're a service based business. We offer we offer the same services, but in different ways. But people were taking Yanni. 10 years ago, you were one in a million and now there's a million. How does that make you feel when you see these brands or they pop up or someone forwards you something? I'm sure you're aware of how like cluttered it's become and people are doing the same kind of thing. Really, 10 years ago when, when I started, Instagram was also just 
born, let's say. The whole thing was super new. And, um, and you know, it was a childhood dream of mine, this whole, you know, uh, weddings, design, flowers. I've always been into that. And it was always, uh, it was always a dream. So when I first, when I moved back and uh, from, from Boston and I wanted to start my career and when um, I started with Lace, I remember clearly my, my cousin, who's a, who's a photographer, she was maybe like the only person that I, I knew on Instagram and she introduced me to it. And she's like, oh, check out this uh, app. It's really cool. And you can edit photos nicely on it. I remember I downloaded it because you, we had the kind of that sepia effect and, and that frame, the original vintage uh, Instagram look. And I remember I created the account, you know, as Lace Events because I had just, you know, launched. And I said, oh, I'll have that also just, for, you know, I'll just put it in, in, in the name Lace Events. And everything was, was super new. Like you said, I didn't know there was no path. It was so organic. Instagram was so organic. And uh, it was just uh, this hub of, of photographers and, and artists and people. Uh, it's crazy to see how it, it evolved and, and changed into what it is today. The good, the bad and the ugly. I mean, a lot of things about it, 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 it great how, how it, it transformed. But for me, being one of the people who were there from the very beginning, it makes me sad sometimes because I miss a lot of things about how it used to be. And, and, and you know, you, there are accounts where you feel they're visually very pleasing, but it's super extra curated where it's not organic. And it's, it's more like, this is the plan. We will post at this time and that time. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm just saying that I maybe never took that path. Everything what uh, I did with my Instagram was was super or organic and it was just everything I was feeling at the moment I would post. I wanted it to be a little bit of me, a little bit of my work because they're very interconnected and that's good and bad about me and my work. Um, you know, I won't say that it's, it's only good because there are parts of it which are, are could be negative to be that interconnected with your with your brand. But I think this is maybe one of the reasons why also you're saying that it, it hopefully it's it stood out because I I would try to post things that that maybe would show what kind of things that I like, what things inspire me, even when if it was my family. Um, you know, now I don't. The last couple of years, I've I've been posting less and less about maybe uh, my private life or, or not that it was ever super uh, private. But, you know, I, I'd have more photos maybe of me and my I, and my family or things like that. But the bigger Instagram got and the more it turned into this, that place it is right now, the, the scarier it got for me to, to, to have to share private things. And I shifted into still trying to, sh you know, post things that I love and enjoy, but, but definitely more reserved than, than I was. In terms of seeing around me, and of course, I do see people share things with me. I don't, I'm usually not a fan of, of someone trying to always follow and, 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 and know, you know, everything that's going around and getting, getting angry about other people who are either imitating or doing, because I, I truly believe that this doesn't do any good. I really believe that it's so important to stick to what you're doing, focus on yourself and on evolving and changing and always doing better uh, because those who are copying you will always be one step behind because they're still trying to catch up and if you're going to look back and see what they're doing you know uh, and get angry about it it's not going to do you any good so it's always just keep looking forward uh, you I truly believe you have to be your own competition in order to feel like okay people loved this last event or they loved what I just did how can I top that you know I want to I want them to see the next one and, and say, oh, my God, I love that one more or, you know, so it's to me, that's the biggest challenge, but also the the most beautiful one to always feel like, no, I can do it. I can do be better than that. And I can do something that, you know, that I would love more. I also always say that there's this super fine line between inspiration and imitation. And unfortunately, a lot of people cross that all the time. And to me, it's 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 basically uh, the the main difference is when you look at something, and you feel that it's you know it's beautiful and it reminds you of something beautiful, but you can't pinpoint what it is. That's kind of when you know something was inspired by something else because everything has been designed before. We you know you um, it's it's all a matter of making it your own. 
And it's a matter of uh, proportion and the way that you do something. Um, so, you know, all of us look at designers, you look at nature, you look at different things to get inspired. But the, the main key point is how to make it your own. Um, and, and when you know something is copied is when you look at something and you're like, it, I don't like it, but it looks like something that I like. You know, it's it's and that's when you know that this has been completely copied because it's like, no, why? Why did you do that? It looks horrible, but it, I know what it reminds me of. And I know the original and I love the original. How do you stay inspired in your business? Like, I'm sure you're inspired by a lot of different things. But how do you make sure that you are not like stuck in a rut where you're repeating the same themes or the same designs? How do you, you know... What do you do strategically to just always be exposed to different ideas? Of course, pre-COVID, when, you know, traveling and nature, you know, just simply walking around in different cities and and being around all these different exhibitions, even window displays, uh, you know, of of shops, all these things, you know. Um, But, you know, when you're here, you need to always be at the look for the latest, even fashion, clothes, colors. Because for me, you know, color mixing is, is one of the, you know, the biggest and most important things in my work. I love mixing colors and I love uh, trying to find the perfect uh, new fun colors that would work together. So you get that a lot from fashion shows, from designers, from different artists, from artworks. So, and, and that's why to me, Instagram, uh, you know, I don't have a private Instagram account. To me, Instagram has always been my happy place because I really do mainly just follow accounts that inspire me, whether it's art and fashion. Because as I scroll down, it's always like uh, saving this. I love that you know, that painting or that dress or that fabric uh, and how to mix all these things together. So definitely it's a big source uh, going online and finding things as well. So, you you know, books, you just have to always try to and even like other my other friends that are um, designers and planners in different parts of the region. You know, it's always nice to follow those who really inspire you. Um, When you started, I remember that you mentioned your father was such an important catalyst to why you started your company. You know, how involved was he and what did he do to inspire you to get started? Definitely. Both my parents were, honestly, they so, you know, they didn't stand in my way or doubt me for one second. Also, because they've always known that this has been a passion of mine and something that I've always wanted to do. But what I love most, most about what they did was they didn't make me feel that I had to wait or maybe, um, you know, they, they were just telling me that if you feel that this is the time and you want to start now, we're with you 100, you know, 100 percent. And but you just have to be sure that this is kind of the career that you you want to do, because I haven't mentioned that. But there was there is another thing that I'm super passionate about, which is education and children. And it's actually what I studied, um, studied early childhood education. And I've always also worked with kids. I'm an only child, so I don't have siblings. And when I was younger, at around 10 years old, my neighbor and one of my best friends uh, and I decided to kind of start a summer school in our uh, in our shared um, common area, which is the pool house. And we uh, it started with our friends and, and and family. We had like five kids. One of them was her sister and 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 our cousins. And it just started as like a fun activity while we were here in in summer break. And that kind of picked up, and we kept doing it till we graduated high school. It actually grew, uh, and we would do it twice a year, and it turned into a full fledged like summer camp run by like eleven year olds at the time. But it it continued. So so when I was applying to university and I wanted to study and trying to decide what I wanted to study, you know, I was torn between, okay, uh, do I do this? Do I do uh, business? Uh, Do I do event planning? Do I do design? So it was a bit of, uh, you know, a tough choice to make. But then I, uh, in the beginning, I chose to go with business because I thought, okay, so I have my uh, experience with with the children from that summer school that I did so I know I love that and I have all my scrapbooks and all my love for weddings and all these photographs from all these different weddings and, and my high school graduation project was actually the, um, designing wedding tables based on 
a different season and, and all of that. So uh, I chose to go for business because I thought it would help me in whichever way I went. Little did I know I hated it. I hated studying business and it took me a year. I did two semesters and I just woke up one day. I was like, no, this is not for me. And I was stuck because I was I was in uh, business school. I, w- I went to Bentley, which is a strictly a business school in Boston. So it was not I couldn't like change majors and do like psychology or something in Bentley. So I had to actually change schools. But I did do that because I was miserable. I hated studying business. It wasn't for me. I'm not a business mind. And I shifted to early childhood education. I loved that. Uh, I moved back to Jeddah in 2010 and my first job was was teaching uh, at a kindergarten. Uh, I did that for two years and simultaneously the second year I launched Late Events because that's when I decided that I didn't want to continue in schools, not because I didn't love working with children, but because I didn't enjoy the process of at the time dealing with the Ministry of Education and all the rules and regulations that were involved and I felt that if if this is the career that I would choose, then I wouldn't be doing much teaching. I would have to be running the school. And I felt that this is not what I wanted to do and it was going to limit my creative side. So that's kind of when I launched uh, Lace Events. And my parents were with me one step of the way with all these changes and <laughs> and all these shifts and ups and downs. And, and, and that's what I love so much is that they really did support me and, and they pushed me to do it from the beginning. What is the best part about your job and the worst part about what you do? So the best part is when everything comes together, because, of course, there's usually months, sometimes weeks only, but still it's a lot of time of preparation, which I still also, of course, love and enjoy, but not as much as when it all comes together the day of or, you know, the couple of days uh, prior to the event. So honestly, I'm on such a high that day, like seeing everything come together and being able to enjoy it. And and it's I guess the worst part is that it's so short, like the, you know, the the part where I see it all together and being able to enjoy it all is super, super short. And then everything comes down and, and it's kind of heartbreaking to see. So I, I would say that this is the part I uh, I hate seeing everything have to come to an end but then of course I sit and just look at the photos and the videos and and just try to take it all in and then yeah so if, especially at the at at uh, weddings to me the best part is after the bride comes and everyone's halas having a good time enjoying dancing or th- all the important big moments are done so I get to actually sit down and I sip on my tea and I just watch it all come together and and you know seeing everyone have a good time such a joy honestly that's I would say that's the best part we're very proud to announce our collaboration with a brand that we strongly resonate with and are huge fans of the woman power podcast will be sponsored by neo books and coffee for our upcoming season four Neo Books and Coffee is an independent bookshop and coffee bar housing a wide collection of both English and Arabic books, stationery, and gifts. Their coffee bar serves and sells quality teas from tea pigs and only the finest Arabica beans. They also have a coffee app available on both iOS and Android devices. The Woman Power Podcast is delighted to be working with our new partners and look forward to producing more meaningful content and recognizing our goals together. Watch the space for more exciting details. Um, I know that when you start a business, you know, sometimes you don't pay yourself in the beginning. You make sure that you can pay for the office and pay for the staff and pay for, you know, um, and I'm sure in your business, especially like you might need some funds to like order stuff or to order in advance or to put deposits. So when did you feel like, okay, I started paying myself fairly for what I deserve or for my time um, or did that even happen? I, I know a lot of people who, you know, till this very day, they're in their business 10, 15 years in and they still don't feel like they're paying themselves what they deserve. So, you know, what's your relationship with, you know, the reward system in your company? It definitely took a couple of years because especially in the very beginning, there are things I didn't know how to to calculate things or how to uh, even charge or, or you know, um, it was all super, super new. And there are things where, let's say, I had to stick to, to a budget or there was something that I wanted to do, but then I felt that the budget won't let me. Uh, and I actually paid from 
you know, from my own money because I knew that this would make a big difference, even if it was small. And I think it's so important in the beginning to, you know, to do that. And it's okay to do that. And I know that the the most successful businesses, at least in the very beginning, did that where you invest. It's more of an investment, you know, it's it's like even, you know, if you feel that something will make a change and a big difference in how um, the outcome will be uh, and you believe in it, but you feel that, you know, maybe the client still doesn't see how important this is and decided that this isn't a priority for them. I did that a lot in the beginning because I had still also, you know, you want you want to prove yourself, you want to have, you're start trying to make a name out of yourself. So there are things in the beginning, you can't start setting rules and, and, and having, you know, charging a minimum or, or, or deciding and how you want to do things. So that happened a lot in the beginning up until I, I figured out, okay, no, so I know myself, I know my taste, I know what's important, I'll have to have ground rules in terms of uh, the, the way I, I do things. And, and it's not just about, oh, I charge this much, or this is gonna, you know, there's a minimum for this, but it's, it's more like from experience and knowing what's important to me, I have to make that clear from the beginning to the client, because sometimes, you know, the clients, they see your photos, they see your work, they love it, but they, they're not, you know, they're not aware of every little detail uh, that made this stand out or why this table or this chair looked so good in the photo, because there's, there's a backstory. There's a lot that went into that for it to pop up this way, whether it's the linens or the uh, the little details that you would think, oh, it's not important. But of course it is, because that's why you came to me. Why do you think this business is not for everyone? I know a lot of people have started, at least in, in my world, have started agencies. Like we do corporate events. We do events with restaurants. We do launch events, digital events. So it's not for everyone. A lot of people start and then exit the space. It's too much for them. But why do you feel like some people started like, wow, this is so much fun. I want to be an event planner or create these experiences. And then they, they, they quit or they move on to something else. Like, what does it take to do this kind of work? So I'll tell you something. And it's not just in, in, um, in event planning. I think it, it falls into all different kinds of businesses. Sometimes you think you love something because you love seeing it or you love the outcome or you feel, oh, I love that. I want to get into that. But it's so important to know the difference between loving something and having good taste, but also how this is not the only thing that's important because you could have good taste, but you don't know how to create something or you don't know how to come up with ideas uh, to, you know, uh, having good taste is not enough. So I think a lot of people see something and feel like, oh, I think that looks easy. Uh, I love it. I think I'll enjoy it. Um, and I think, oh, definitely I can do that. It looks super simple, you know. And then when they're into it and they start doing it, they realize that it's not as simple as they thought it was or or that if they're if they've been copying, you know, they're running out of copying ideas, for example, or that it's not sustainable because people are picking up on that, you know. Uh, another reason would be, you know, um, it takes a lot of different important, let's say, characteristics to be able to to run such a business. You know, you you need to be someone who is a people, you don't have to be a people's person, but you need to know how to deal with people and, and clients because it's it's a very intimate sort of relationship you at some point you turn into a, a therapist, you know, if it's if if need be with with a bride or with her mom, you know, you get so involved. So a lot of people eventually feel like, OK, I love the design part of it, but I really hate dealing with people. I can't do it. Masalan. Fa, you know, you can't just think that because you like one part of it, it does not mean you can do the whole thing. So I think uh, whether it's event planning or any other business, I think it's 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 that. What have you sacrificed to be able to do this? I mean, when you are there for someone and probably one of the most magical experiences of their life, also very stressful, the coming together of two families, uh, multiple opinions, lots of ego. My question to you is, you know, what have you sacrificed to be there for your clients and to put on these events, sometimes in a short amount of time? At some point, especially like, let's say the maybe not the first few years, but kind of in the middle, things did get stressful in that time where it's a shift between, okay, I'm getting good at this. I feel like I've built a name. I'm getting more and more work, bigger projects, but then you're a bit 
you're you're you know you're in that place where you still don't know how to juggle it all together and also still maintain your uh your well-being your health your sleep all of that it all got uh, affected at some point it took me a while to be able to find the balance and maybe only quite recently where um where i've realized okay this is this is me time this is what's important this is how i need to i need to find time and 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 make sure that this is a priority because if you're not feeling well and if you're not healthy and if you're not at the best of of your ability to maintain all this going on around you you won't be able to deliver uh in the way that you should so so definitely for a while it was it wasn't easy but i quite recently felt that i found the balance one of the things that i admire about you is you really know yourself like you have a specific style I feel like you're the type of person like okay there could be two chairs that are similar and you're like no for that one yes for that one like you, you I feel like you could make decisions because you know yourself well you know what works for you you know what you like how does someone get to that space I'm the type of person that's like I can make anything work give me this chair I'll make it work give me that chair I'll make it work but how do you develop such a strong sense of style and taste Honestly, I don't know. <laughs> like I don't know how I I just feel like I know it when I see it, you know? And sometimes, you know, um some of um um people that I work with and, you know, especially when we're making decisions and they're showing me samples, they, they you know, they always make fun of me and they're like, "Ah, she's just going to, you know, she's going to look at it and, you know, to them, for example, it's all let's say beige." And and I'm like, No 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 that's not beige you know so it's like it's it's these little things that to me I you know I can see it and my eye can see it and it just I'm I'm very visual and there are a lot of things that uh for me um I I you know I do a lot of last minute changes because I see something and I'm like no this needs to come down 5 centimeters and they're like are you seriously going to make us go through all of this for 5 centimeters and I'm like yes and then when it's done they're like Oh thank god we did that you know so there are things that I don't know if I've kind of with time I've developed but I just feel like there are things that are just part of me you know that I've just always had I guess like I can see if 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 a certain shade of color is bothering me or 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 a fabric or you know uh so I don't know I really don't know what to tell you what would your advice be to somebody who wants to start their own business I would say if I had the chance in the beginning to to be to be an intern and to um to get the experience with someone who was uh you know accomplished in that field and someone who I felt inspired me I would have definitely done that and you know at the time when I started it was very new and there wasn't really anyone doing that at least here I kind of you know just went with it and started the only way I knew how and uh, so I definitely I uh, believe that experience is so so important. I know a lot of people want to just launch and start their own business. There's nothing wrong with that, but I I would strongly um uh, recommend having the experience first and working for someone uh, that inspires you and that you feel you can learn from and then you know take your own path and do your own thing. What is your plan for laces? Like what's the big hairy audacious goal? I definitely have like a million and one ideas and uh you know it's it's crazy how you always think you have time and you always think like I'll do that next year and uh the maybe the the upside of covid is just we've had the time to you know be able to make a plan or or try to decide okay what's my next step how do i want to do this when do i want to do this so there's definitely a lot that i feel i can do and want to do uh in terms of um under the umbrella of lace events but maybe like a uh, you know not so under the umbrella but also like it's kind of own uh brand let's say uh because yeah there are ideas of of product design there are ideas of 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 you know of flowers it's all these things that inspire me and that I love to do um but I just always felt like I'll do it a little bit later on in life because I feel like now with with you know with with events and with um with that uh kind of of work that I'm doing you'll only be this young and this energetic 
for, you know, not for super, super long. And I feel like I want to do that as long as I can right now, uh, because I know I'd want to slow down later on in life and be able to do all these other things that I've put aside. What keeps you motivated, Sarah? I feel like you're such a driven person because it's not easy to put all this effort into like temporary experiences. It's not like you're, you know, you're designing, you know, uh, a store. I mean, even that could be temporary, but like, it's not like you're designing something permanent, you know, you're, you're creating these installations and then they disappear. So my question is, I think for you to keep doing that over and over again is, you know, you have to be a highly motivated person. So what drives you? What, what gets you excited? I'm definitely motivated when it comes to that, but it's also how much I love what I do. Honestly, that's what motivates me. It's it's the happiness that I feel and uh, after um, after every project and seeing it all to come, all, see it all come together and and be able to feel like oh my god, I love it. I did that, uh, and it's it's. You know, it's holding on to that feeling and wanting more of it. Um, and of course, there are times where all of us go 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 through periods of time where you feel demotivated or you feel like I don't want to do this or or I feel like I've reached you know just like a block. So that definitely happens. But you just you need something to spark that energy again. And um, and sometimes it's it's a trip. Sometimes it's a friend talking to a friend. Sometimes it's you know things that. Uh, unexpected things so yeah so I do believe passion is one of the most important things when it comes to your your job I, I do feel very very lucky uh, and fortunate to have that because you know everyone's different everyone's not everyone has that in their career path and it's not I'm not saying that everyone needs to be super passionate uh, because there are different jobs that you know maybe are more not as especially when it's not in the in the creative side but at least there has to be a liking of what you do and and a reason to wake up and and do that that changes your life you said in the beginning that because of covid you know you were able to do things that you thought you would do at a later stage what are some of those things that you had kind of on your to-do list that covid gave you a chance to do so uh, it was more of of research and kind of making um, or starting a business plan for all the other things that I've been uh, that I've had on hold. Uh, so I used that time to basically research and and think of the different directions that I you know uh, want want to head towards in terms of of career wise and and future plans because you know even though they've always been in the back of my head, but I always felt like. I don't have time now to sit and do that. It'll come. The time will come. So time did come with COVID. And, you know, for a while, all we had is time. So I, I kind of just made plans and, and to-do lists. And, and I've done a lot of research. So, yeah. What do you feel is your superpower? I feel like I have this uh, super, super strong, like, intuition and gut feeling when it comes to everything in my life. And, um uh, it helped me in many different things, uh, and I feel uh, it definitely helped me with my work. Uh, a lot of things where I felt that you know um, this project, I just feel like it's not good for me. I don't want to take it. I don't know why. I can't put my finger on it, and then it just doesn't happen. And and then later on, I'm like, thank God that didn't happen. Other projects where you know uh, I felt like this would. Um, you know, be good for me. And, uh, and I just, I have feeling about it, even though it's, it's, it was super small or something that I, you know, uh, you know, one would ask, why, why did you take that? Like, you know, and, and then something really good came, came out of it. It's the same with, with life in general, with friendships, with, uh, with business deals, with a, a lot of things. So I, you know, sometimes I don't know what it is, but I just feel like I have that. And I do feel like it's a superpower. <laughs> It is a superpower. And how do you stay so in tune with your intuition? Because sometimes I question my intuition. Like, I don't know. Like, should I do that? Like, so there's like, there's, there's always a voice that says, do it. Don't do it. Stop. Go. But then also there's my questioning of it. So how do you stay true to your intuition? And, and my other question is, have, has your intuition ever failed you? Like, oh, I should have said yes instead of no or no instead of yes. And, you know, my gut was wrong. So look, I I try to see how I feel. Sometimes I sleep on it. Sometimes you know you 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 question it, like you said. 
uh, but then you also kind of have to work on it. So you have to pick up on on you know on signs or like uh, you try to see how it's going. And if you if you feel like things are in the coming in the way and it's not going as planned, then oh uh, maybe that was a sign. So you kind of have to keep up with what's happening after the decision or even in that time where you're trying to make the decision because that these are all signs. And when it comes to regret, um, you know. I truly, truly believe uh, that what is meant for you will not miss you and the other way around. So even if there's something where, you know, you feel like, ah, oh, I wish I got that project or I wish, you know, you do feel this way sometimes. But then immediately I say, if it was meant for me, I would have taken it or it would have happened. There's a reason it didn't happen. You know, I'm super content when it comes to these things, because I think it's so important to believe in that. Not that you shouldn't go after what you want or try to, of course, you, you should try to, you know, push for things and try to get things. But if you feel like there are signs, believe in these signs. If you feel like there are things here and there that are telling you don't do it, then, you know, just don't do it. <laughs> do you negotiate your prices or are you very strict about your fees? Because again, due to your capacity, you know, you re if you're going to spend months doing something or doing a, an event you really have to be able to like secure that one client per quarter or one client every month or two months so you know how are you with pricing do you go back and forth or if someone negotiates with you you're like you know it's not worth it or you know what is your strategy when it comes to because I always say like in this part of the world we do business like we are in the soog like it's just our culture like and if and if you don't give a little discount people get upset it's not like anywhere else um i mean people go to stores like proper department stores and try to get like gifts and discounts so you know it's just the way things are so how do you deal with that uh it also took a while because it's also trial and error you know in the very beginning trying to, to find a way i like to make things clear and uh i prefer that style of of dealing with things and having you know just being clear from the beginning with the client that you know of course every project is different and the fees in every project depending on the scope is different but i mean when i do give a proposal or or, or do that uh it's important for me to make it clear that the fees are not negotiable when it comes to that but the actual budget of the event somewhat could be negotiable depending on the size and the requirements and all of that so so you leave a kind of a window of but you also have to have a standard because and you you develop this with time with with experience with knowing where I can't do something that's going to jeopardize my work and the quality which means that I need to start at a certain amount or a certain uh you know I I can't go uh below that or else I know that I won't have room to be creative because there are things, you know, as much as you, you want to be able to, to do things and not maybe spend too much in certain things. But with experience, you know that there are things that are just are costly and for you to be able to do them and not have that, um, uh, you know, come in the way, you just need to set that and make it clear from the beginning. So, yeah, I... I I believe that this is the best way. Are there any brands that inspire you? Is there someone that you look to like, wow, I love everything that they do. I love their career progression. I love their business model. Of course, there are so many on an international level, on a local level. Level. One of the very uh, first, actually, she's a friend of mine now, but she was uh, definitely an inspiration to me. And she's helped me from the beginning. And I, I approached her when I first wanted uh, when I first started with lace events is, is Bibi Hayat who's a, a Kuwaiti uh, um, event planner and uh, she's someone who I love and respect so much she's uh, a beautiful person inside and out uh, I love what she stands for I love the way she built her company uh, um, and I love that mashallah alayha she managed to you know, uh, stay um, super passionate um, and um, but also be able to grow and do things business wise uh, that I feel is very difficult uh, to, to have simultaneously. And, uh, you know, to me, of course, there's, you know, we talk all the time and she 
there's we all you know she struggles a kid that's not easy but she she makes it work and she's always uh there for you know for me whenever i need anything we always speak she always she's always getting better she's always coming up with with new ideas to help those around her as well this was amazing sara like thank you so much i genuinely like have been a huge fan of what you've done for a very long time I love your work and I do feel like you started a movement because I think a lot of women and men possibly like I think a lot of people saw what you were doing and it, it moved something in them and they started uh, creating their own experiences as well. That's it for this week. Thank you for listening to an episode of the Women Power podcast and thank you for downloading and streaming our podcast every week. If you love what you've heard, tag us on Instagram and follow the Woman Power podcast and Woman Power Summit account for more information on our next episode. Please leave a rating review wherever you get your podcast. It really helps other women discover the show. That's it from me. See you next week.